Hello, and welcome to the Community IT Innovators Technology Topics Podcast, where we discuss nonprofit technology, cybersecurity, tech project implementation, strategic planning, and nonprofit IT careers. Find us at communityit.com. Welcome to the October Community IT Innovators webinar. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar on cybersecurity training for nonprofits. Your staff are your best defense. My name is Johan Hammerstrom, and I'm the CEO of Community IT and the moderator for this webinar series. The slides and recording for today's webinar will be available on our website and YouTube channel later this week. Please use the chat feature during the webinar to ask questions, and we will do our best to respond. Before we begin, we'd like to tell you a little bit more about our company. Community IT is a 100% employee-owned company. Our team of 36 staff is dedicated to helping nonprofit organizations advance their missions through the effective use of technology. We are technology experts, and we have been consistently named a top 501 managed services provider by Channel Futures, and we received this honor again in 2020. And now it's my pleasure to introduce today's presenter, our Chief Technology Officer and Cybersecurity Expert, Matthew Eshelman. Good afternoon, Matt. I've really been looking forward to this webinar all month. Great. Thanks, Johan. I appreciate the introduction and thanks to everybody who's joining today. Uh, as Johan mentioned, uh, the slides and the recording of this will be made available uh, to everyone after uh, the event. So if you missed something, don't worry, uh, you'll be able to go back and review it uh, and also uh, share it if uh, you find some of the content interesting. So um, as Johan mentioned, uh, the topic for this month's webinar is gonna be cybersecurity training for nonprofits. We've been spending a lot of time uh, talking about cybersecurity uh, over the last couple of years, and I think that's only ramped up. I think, you know, especially in today's day and age when we're, you know, it, these are not normal times. We are, you know, many of us working from home. I'm, I'm coming to you from my, uh, from my basement. You know, kids are home. Uh, you know, work has just been uh, chaotic. Uh, you know, and and adversaries have been taking advantage of that with lots of different uh, spear phishing attacks and uh, COVID attacks. And so uh, hopefully the content that we'll talk about today will help equip you and equip your organization to better identify and protect yourself uh, against those cybersecurity threats. So specifically, uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about the cybersecurity landscape. I think it's helpful for us to just get started with an understanding of uh, kind of the cyber world that we're operating in. Uh, we'll then look at some specific kind of things that you can identify uh, as cyber security for cybersecurity training to educate yourselves as a as a as an end user here. Uh, we'll go into some concepts that are called the human firewall uh, as a way to help protect your organization and your data. Uh, and then finally, we'll talk a little bit about uh, how to put it all together and put it into action. So this um, we'll talk about some specific things that individuals can do. Uh, and then if you're responsible for cybersecurity at your organization, I think there'll be some things that you'll be able to pick up uh, uh, as well. So we've got um, some different uh, content here. And so I think to that end, let's go ahead and uh, just get started with um, who's responsible for uh, cybersecurity in your organization. So there should be a poll that pops up uh, here. And so go ahead and just chat in those or uh, select in those answers. Just curious to see, uh, you know, both for, uh, for yourself and for the everybody on the webinar, uh, you know, who's responsible for cybersecurity in your organization? Is it uh, yourself, uh, maybe the IT department, uh, maybe operations, maybe no one, uh, or maybe you've outsourced that uh, to a managed service provider, um, you know, for example, like uh, community IT. So we provide uh, managed IT services to about 140 different organizations here, uh, kind of in the DC metro area and, and beyond. Um, and so that gives us some perspective on, uh, you know, what nonprofit organizations are facing in this, in this realm. So thanks for that response. We'll go ahead and uh, uh, close that and share. So we can see that, uh, yeah, today, uh, those folks that said me are responsible for cybersecurity, that's great, um, you're in, in the right place. Uh, if you've outsourced some of this to a, a managed service provider, um, maybe this will give you some questions to ask them or some talking points to make sure that you've got uh, good coverage. And so 
uh, hopefully there'll be something for you to take away from uh, from this. All right, so moving into uh, the cybersecurity landscape, um, we know that we're in a world where there are persistent and ongoing uh, brute force attacks on your online, your digital identity. So again, if you, you know, are in Office 365 or G Suite, uh, you know, basically if you can log into it uh, over the web, then the bad guys can too. And so we just see it from the security logs that there is just, uh, you know, a massive amount of automated uh, brute force attacks on your digital identity. Uh, we can also see that there's been a really a dramatic increase in the amount of uh, rather sophisticated spear phishing uh, that is targeting, you know, the the operation staff, the finance associates, the HR people in your organizations, uh, trying to target them to get, uh, you know, either financial information or personnel information out of them. Um, we also see that organizations are targeted because of the work that they do, and so especially in this run up to uh, an election, uh, we're seeing organizations, specifically those that are working in uh, the um, foreign policy area are really targeted um, by some sophisticated actors trying to get in and get access to information. Uh, organizations that are focusing on democracy and good governance are also uh, big targets in this realm. So, you know, it's not just, you know, kind of garden variety, uh, you know, a, a spray attack that's targeting any, everybody. Uh, there are specific focused attacks uh, on organizations because of the work that they do. And then there's also targets um, uh, against vendors. So again, uh, as a managed service provider, you know, we have information about a lot of uh, our clients in terms of their privileged accounts, uh, and so we're a target, uh, and that's something that, um, uh, you know, the Center for Infrastructure um, Security Agency has, has been uh, sounding alarm at, and so it's something that we're especially conscientious of. Um, you know, the good news is that uh, there are some new uh, security tools available to help combat these threats. And so we'll talk about some of those today. Uh, and I think it's also great that organizations are starting to be more proactive about their, uh, about their security. And, you know, I think it points that this uh, webinar specifically, I think is, is one of the, the most popular, the most uh, registered. We have the most number of registrants for this webinar because I think there's a real desire of organizations to be proactive, uh, to equip their users, to equip their staff to better identify and protect against cybersecurity uh, attacks. It's not all good news. Uh, you know, we know that about 68% uh, of nonprofits don't actually have an incident response plan. So that's a, a guide to say, hey, here's what happens whenever we do have a breach or we do have uh, some sort of security incident. So that's from N10. Uh, and, you know, we also know that that uh, responding to incidents can be expensive. So uh, the latest numbers say about $149,000 in terms of direct cost uh, to respond to a security incident. Now, you know, I know many of us, uh, we see the big numbers in the news about, you know, the Sonys and, and you know, Home Depots and kind of the big uh, organizations that get targeted uh, and kind of our eyes glaze over. But uh, this does represent a real financial uh, threat to our organizations uh, that needs to be taken into consideration. So specifically, uh, you know, we see this uh, information. This is taken from um, the Verizon Data Breach Investigation Report, which is a really fantastic uh, document that, uh, Verizon Security Services puts out, and so they've identified, uh, you know, these are kind of some specific dollar amounts that uh, are tied into data breaches. So again, you know, credit card information, you know, that's a couple dollars per record. Uh, if you've got PII, so personally identifiable information, um, perhaps about uh, a customer, you know, that's twenty to four hundred and fifty dollars. So again, that could be a social security number, you know, combined with date of birth and address. Uh, same thing for employees. So again. Uh, you know, even if you don't have PII about maybe your constituents, you know, you certainly have PII data about your employees. So again, all that HR information, social security numbers, uh, that's all stored and managed by HR. And so it's important uh, that data is protected. Medical records, you know, if there's sales uh, or financial information um, or proprietary information about your organization, uh, that would be valuable to, again, like I said, a state actor wanting to know kind of what policy positions you're taking, uh, you know, all of these things that we have as an organization, you know, have some value to somebody else. So, you know, uh, the hackers, you know, they're out there, they may not all be geniuses with, you know, an IQ of 197, and they may not need, you know, 15% of your passwords. Um, but uh, the adversaries are out there. Uh, 
uh, and they may look more like this, uh, which are uh, state-sponsored adversaries. And so uh, that means it's it's not just somebody in their basement, you know, kind of doing this for, uh, you know, for, for kind of the sport of it. Uh, these are well-funded uh, organizations that are sponsored by by the state and have a mandate to do information reconnaissance uh, and maintain persistence in organizations to kind of figure out what's going on. Uh, so here we see, you know, there's uh, state-sponsored actors in the Democratic Republic of uh, North Korea. We've got uh, Russia involved. Uh, that we have the China, uh, the Panda representing China. Um, so there are a range of well-funded state-sponsored actors um, that are out there, and we actually see them in the nonprofit space. So. Uh, it's it's a, I think it's a real wake up call for organizations to take their cybersecurity seriously because as a nonprofit, you know you cannot fly under the radar. You know just because you're small, just because you're doing um, good work, uh, you know you've got stuff that's interesting, uh, you know to these other uh, entities. So in terms of how that informs our approach to cybersecurity, um, you know we really want to start and root that in security policy. Um, build on that security awareness. So that's what we're really going to be focused on today is talking about how to identify some of these threats, how to mitigate against them, and, and some steps to take to defend. Um, then build on that, you know, identity, data, uh, you know, protection against devices, perimeter, uh, you know, the web, you know, and then and then layer on uh, some next-gen tools. So uh, we've talked about this in a little bit more detail in uh, some of our previous webinars. We also have a cybersecurity playbook um, that's on our website that you can register for and download. So, uh, Johan, you can go ahead and uh, chat out those links. And there's some other links that I'll be sharing as well uh, to reference uh, as you go on. So, um, you know, we take a, a holistic perspective in security uh, and kind of, I think, rooted in policy and really, uh, you know, understanding that we can have great technology tools in place. I'm a technology person. You know, I love, uh, you know, all the gadgets, all the shiny stuff, the fancy software, but uh, you know, my view is that, you know, this technology is really, you know, it's it's driven by the end users and you can have all the greatest, you know, whiz bang security tools in place. And if you've got staff, you know, that aren't engaged, that aren't informed, uh, you know, it's really hard uh, to protect against every uh, eventuality. And so uh, having, you know, educated and aware staff really raises the overall level of the security in the organization. So I did want to you know, kind of frame that to say, hey, it's it's good to talk openly about cybersecurity. This is not something that we, uh, you know, IT does to everybody else. This is something that we want to create a, a culture to uh, engage everybody in it. Uh, this is something where we want staff to be able to share their story and to learn. And so, uh, you know, a situation where somebody can can share with their colleague, like, hey, I got this really weird email. What do you think? Um, is a much better situation than somebody clicking on a link and then asking about it afterwards or being embarrassed um, and, and kind of not sharing with, with you know, a colleague or IT that they may have clicked on something or done something uh, that's going to have a negative impact. So again, you know, we really want to build that culture of openness because we know that, you know, your experience is going to help somebody else, you know, so somebody sharing like, oh, you know, I had, had to help my, you know, my parent, you know, deal with this IT issue, or I had to help my colleague do this, or hey, this is something that happened to me. I think is a really important part around building a culture of um, of good uh, security in your organization. It's something that I, in my view, uh, should be encouraged. So we're going to take a look at uh, some contemporary uh, attack examples. So th these are things that we see uh, as an IT support provider, and so I'm sure that. You may have seen something similar to this, um, so please feel free to, you know, maybe chat that in uh, or share some examples that you've encountered on your own. So specifically, we'll look at some email phishing uh, examples. We'll talk about malware, uh, and then we'll also talk about some social engineering attacks. Um, and I think those are particularly interesting uh, and dangerous because, uh, you know, no amount of great, uh, you know, kind of cybersecurity tools is going to be able to provide 100% protection. Uh, against those types of attacks. So specifically on phishing, we'll look at some common attempts, uh, how to identify them, and then, you know, kind of what to do once you've identified them. Uh, you know, so here we can see is our first example. Uh, this is an email that that I got myself, uh, uh, you know, a, a year or so ago. And, you know, we can see it looks 
I don't know, relatively benign. I'm the chief technology officer. I buy stuff all the time. Um, and so it's not uncommon that I would get an invoice or something. Um, but however, whenever we take a look, uh, and one of the things that you can do in terms of identifying what are some tips to identify uh, the source of some information is just hover over the link, right? So we've got an invoice from an online invoices. You know, it looks pretty legit. Uh, it's got all these details. But uh, whenever we hover over that view invoice, we don't see view invoice anymore. We see you know http colon slash slash corp caterers cleveland dot com uh, and then a random string of numbers. So again, uh, you know, from this example, we can see that uh, maybe the adversary has actually compromised. Uh, that organization's domain, maybe their website, uh, and they're they're combining, uh, you know, a commercial online invoice template uh, with a redirect or malicious link. So again, just hovering over the link is a great way to take a look and see, hey, does this really match up? Does this make sense? You know, one, am I expecting an invoice? Uh, and then two, like, oh, does this online invoice match uh, the link, match the the domain or the sender that I'm expecting? Uh, here's an example, and this this is um, being highlighted through one of our security awareness tools. And so this is uh, what what a tool called Nobleford do, uh, does in terms of their training, and it just highlights some of the things to look at. So again, uh, you know the red flag things to look for here are the email uh, from address. Again, does this make sense? It's not coming from just WellsFargo.com. It's coming from alerts. Our uh, devices dash wellsfargo.com. So again, maybe uh, not the address that you would expect. Uh, it has some generic information. So again, dear customer, uh, confirm your device. There's often a call to action uh, in these messages that are trying to get you to click on a malicious link. Uh, and so being able to identify, you know, is this coming from somebody that I expect? Uh, is there, you know, unique knowledge about, you know, me uh, personally that that would, you know, make me want to click on this? Uh, and then, you know, what's the call to action? Is this something that I'm expecting? So again, just taking a look at those um, pieces of information is really helpful to identify if something is is legitimate or uh, is perhaps malicious. And then the final um, piece just to show off here is, you know, another thing that you can do is just uh, if you reply to the message, uh, as soon as you reply to the message, uh, it will actually reveal the tr the original, the real from address. And so here we can see that there's a mismatch between the from in the body of the message and the to now that's in this in the address line. So again, uh, even if something you know, you got you kind of have one more chance uh, if you're going to reply to a message because it will often reveal that the original from address is different uh, than the two. So hackers have gotten really good at masking uh, or hiding the um, the from address. Uh, and so it makes it a little bit more difficult to identify if it's if it's from somebody you know you you know and trust or or somebody that's just masquerading uh, as that domain. So again, if you you know go in and choose reply, uh, you'll see that name displayed and it'll be a little bit easier to identify if that is from uh, a sender that you you actually know. So, you know, this is a graphic that comes from um, staysafeonline.org. So this is a, a government, uh, you know, your federal tax dollars at work, um, organization that is here to support kind of good cybersecurity. Uh, and so as October is Cybersecurity Awareness Month, there's a lot of content and resources available. And, uh, you know, they had this infographic, you know, Everybody loves dogs, uh, maybe not as much as cats, I don't know, but uh, just reminding us, hey, think before you click. If you're unsure who an email is from, don't click on any links uh, or attachments found in that email. So again, you know, an ounce of prevention in this case is definitely worth a pound of cure. So for phishing emails or for phishing um, messages, I think it's really, uh, you know, a good idea to, yeah, to take that second look at the email. Check for those red flags again. Uh, hover over the links, look at the reply to address. Um, does that all make sense? And then if you're still in doubt and you're not sure, uh, ask someone or forward it to your IT support provider. Uh, you know, I know that's something that we certainly encourage here at Community IT. You know, if, if our clients have a message they're not really sure about, I would much rather them, uh, you know, forward it into our help desk for them to take a look at uh, instead of clicking on something and then trying to claw back uh, information, you know, after it's gone out. So again, 
uh, you know, I know it, it could be a little bit harder to do that now that so many of us are working um, virtually all the time. Um, but, you know, if you've got an IT partner, an in-house IT person or somebody else, you know, it's definitely worth getting a second opinion before clicking on something. So uh, just remember to follow those three steps in terms of, you know, taking a look at the email, check for the red flags, and then ask somebody uh, for, for help. So moving on to talk a little bit about uh, malware as an attack kind of vector, we'll look at, you know, malware often will come as part of those email attachments that are coming from unknown or suspicious senders. Um, but malware can also be launched against organizations from things like, uh, you know, actually malicious websites or even w advertising within a website. Um, thankfully, this is not as common anymore. This was mostly targeting uh, Flash. Uh, and so with, with Flash being deprecated, uh, we don't see this as much, but it is still a, a risk. And then finally, talk a little bit about crypto jacking, uh, which has a very cool name, um, but actually has some real security implications. So uh, malware does keep rising. So this is from an organization called avtest.org. Um, and so they receive samples of malicious software. And so we can see, you know, this is, this is up to date in terms of the total number of unique malware samples that they receive. And the number just kind of keeps going up and up and up and up. It's, it's very easy now for malware writers to, to take software, to manipulate it, to generate a new file hash or a new ID and make something that's kind of no antivirus tool has seen before. So again, the number of malware uh, out there does keep rising. Uh, also in this category uh, is something called PUA or potentially unwanted applications. Um, and so that could be stuff like, uh, you know, that browser extension that you installed to, to help with a tool uh, or, you know, some other, uh, you know, add-in or widget um, that you're not quite sure how you got, but is now on your computer. So again, potentially unwanted applications. And that just really provides adversaries, you know, a foothold into your system. And so that could be used to launch further attacks down the road or, or maybe used for some other malicious processes. Uh, this is an example of uh, malvertising. So again, uh, this is a couple years ago, but this was uh, an example of how the crypto wall virus uh, was delivered. So it was actually delivered via uh, an exploited flash uh, advertisement. So again, very sophisticated, very hard to um, defend against. Um, and so, you know, this looks like just some generic uh, you know, Bing ad, uh, but was actually used to deliver Flash. So we use some uh, sophisticated technology uh, to block this kind of stuff um, from a vendor called Cisco. So we're using Cisco Umbrella to block malicious content uh, that may not get, get uh, that may get through, you know, kind of the traditional firewall, and then your traditional antivirus is not going to pick up as well. So again, uh, it's kind of be careful what you click on, be careful what you um, you know, are, are, are kind of navigating through to avoid these kinds of situations. Um, and then finally, I did want to raise, you know, another uh, technique that we have started to see, which is called crypto jacking. Uh, so crypto is crypto short for cryptocurrency or Bitcoin. Um, and so what in this case, what occurs is that uh, you know, an adversary will launch some, usually some malicious JavaScript that mines cryptocurrency. So again, cryptocurrency is a pretty um, processor and uh, uh, power intensive task. So, uh, you know, instead of having a dedicated, you know, mining rig kind of sucking up electricity and, and consuming more in electricity than you're getting uh, in Bitcoin, you can, you know, use malware to just have a bunch of other uh, computers do that for you. So it uses your computer's power for the adversary's benefit. So, uh, you know, if you wanna get in the Wayback Machine, you can kind of think of this as like SETI, you know, they're scanning for extraterrestrial life, you know, distributed their software to everybody's computer. And so, you know, your computer can kind of chunk away uh, in the background while you were doing other work or while your computer wasn't busy. Um, so think of that model, but just kind of for a nefarious purpose. You know, you're not gonna discover alien life, but you're gonna be buy, uh, mining some crypto coin for, uh, for some adversary. And then the final piece that I wanna talk about in terms of a type of attack that we often see, and I think this one's maybe the most um, sophisticated or uh, the most impactful is just social engineering attacks. And so we see these uh, as tricking you 
into making payments. Again, you know, as innocuous as buying some gift cards, uh, maybe as sophisticated as updating wire transfer information uh, could be tricking you into entering credentials uh, as a way to then you know launch other attacks or you know trick you into calling for you know quote unquote support to address a, an issue. You know, so here's an example of what we see as, as the first step in a lot of these attacks. So again, uh, here's our CEO, Johan, who's emailing our CFO, Bill. Hey, Bill, confirm if you're available. I'm in back-to-back -back meetings, so just respond to my email if you're available, thanks. You know, so very short, to the point, really hard for traditional anti-spam to protect against this. Uh, and so then what we would see is that Bill, if he replies to this, would say, oh yeah, what do you need? And the follow-up email is often like, oh, I need you to buy gift cards. Like I really want to surprise staff. Uh, you know, and I think adversaries know that, you know, HR and executives are often now looking at, you know, having some kind of benefit or gift or something to send to staff because of, you know, all this like work from home stuff. And it's just, you know, we're, we're trying to do, you know, good stuff for our, uh, staff of the organization. Um, and so this is often how these attacks start, you know, some quick engagement to take advantage of and prey on our feelings of like, oh, like we really need to be responsive uh, to our CEO, or we really need to be responsive to our, uh, you know, executive director or finance person. Um, and so again, this will be targeted at your, you know, the finance associates or the new intern who's, who really wants to make sure they don't screw up. And so they're, they're, you know, being really responsive to any request they get. Uh, and maybe they didn't notice that, wait a minute, this is not from Johan Hammerstrom at communityit.com. It's from, you know, wireless at ext03.com. So again, there are some clues here that you need to be aware of. You know, we've actually implemented a sophisticated um, tool to help block this. Uh, and so that's, that's why we've got uh, the analysis information on here, but uh, I did wanna show this as an example of, hey, uh, these are the types of attacks that will often be initiated from email. And then uh, since you've started a conversation, then, you know, spam filters and other stuff may not actually end up blocking it because it says, oh, well, you've already had a, you know, an email exchange with this email address. We're just going to let it go. So again, uh, look, look at that call to action. Uh, look at that unusual request. Um, the example that you see up in your screen now um, is really uh, an example of, of kind of credential harvesting. So again, you may get a link uh, to, you know, a shared document. There's no malicious attachment for antivirus to block. Uh, it's just going to the website. Uh, you go to a website, it says, hey, you need to log in with your credentials to see that. You know, we're often sharing stuff online. Um, and then you go ahead and uh, enter in your credentials um, without noticing in the message bar that this is not, you know, the Dropbox website, but is in fact, you know, landmarks.com.mx uh, is the address. So again, uh, it's preying upon, uh, you know, our lack of sophistication and being able to see like, oh, wait, this is not uh, a legitimate Dropbox sharing site. This is coming from, uh, you know, a malicious or spoofed account. And I would say adversaries are really getting sophisticated uh, at building good looking mockups of, you know, an Office 365 login site or a Google Docs sharing site or something where, you know, it looks pretty real and you can go ahead and type in your password. Uh, and if in this case, if they type in your password and hit sign in, like nothing's actually going to happen other than the password, you know, being added to the database of the adversary who's now, you know, harvesting all these credentials and then we'll use them uh, later in, in follow-up attacks. <clears throat> and let's see, the final example, um, it's something that looks super scary, uh, which is these kind of splashes that say, oh, your computer's at risk, you know, you got to give us a call for support. Um, I think this is something that uh, you know, I think this is something that, like my parents um, have been targeted by. Uh, and so it looks really scary. It looks really dangerous. And so in this case, you know, you call that number, somebody will helpfully take your credit card uh, to pay for the support incident. They may log into your computer, maybe run some command prompts that look like there's a lot of stuff happening, and then they'll just leave. Um, so again, if you ever see these splash um, pages come up on your on your system, like the best thing to do is just you know, uh, you know, you could close your computer if, if that feels right. Uh, if you're a little bit more sophisticated, you could, you know, uh, go through and try to close the application or Alt F4 will we'll close out uh, that account. 
uh, or that application and then, you know, kind of, kind of go on, um, you know, if you've got up to date antivirus and, and like I said, some, some web content blocking software, uh, that should eliminate this type of, you know, seeing this type of threat. Um, but still I think adversaries have gotten pretty good at, at kind of, you know, this page in and of itself isn't necessarily malicious. Like there's nothing, there's no virus on here. It's just a call to action, a social engineering attack to get you to, uh, to click on something and, Again, just turn over your credit card willingly. So let's move on to talk a little bit more about, you know, some some tools or a technique uh, to kind of think about how we can protect the information that we have or the information um, that our organization has. Uh, and this is kind of done under the framework of this rubric or guidance of of the human firewall. So again, I think it's a particularly you know apt now that you know many of us are now working from home, like we're not behind our organization's firewall. We don't have the server, you know, kind of down the hall. We're, we're not in our office, you know, kind of protected. You know, we're at our homes. Like maybe we don't have a sophisticated firewall. Uh, you know, maybe we're using our personal computer instead of our, you know, work provided computer that, that has, you know, more up-to-date or sophisticated security tools. So again, you know, the security perimeter really is, is us now uh, and our device. And so what are some things that we need to be aware of in order to make sure that we're protecting the data that we have access to? Um, and I fundamentally view that there's kind of two different elements that here. So we've got uh, protecting the device. Uh, and I think historically, uh, this has been where a lot of IT security controls have been focused around. Like, you know, we're going to protect the device. We're going to have a firewall, protect the network. We're going to have a you know, antivirus to protect the computer. We're going to do all this stuff to protect the devices. Um, but in, you know, as most of this stuff is now shifted into the cloud, uh, you know, we're now looking at how can we protect the identity, again, our online digital identity. If somebody has our username and password, you know, they can get access to everything that we can. So how do we protect the identity as well? And, and kind of how do those two things combine uh, to inform our approach to, um, to cybersecurity? So I think fundamentally, uh, you know, on the data side, you know, just understand that, you know, you're capable of protecting um, your information. Uh, I think if you're, you know, again, from from the individual perspective, you know, have a good idea of where your data lives, uh, you know, where your files at, where your photos at, you know, what applications do you have, uh, and then is that data backed up? You know, is it in more than one place? Uh, you know, or are you just relying on you know the the provider itself to make sure that that data is protected? So again, having a good understanding of where your data is, and if it's protected by another system, uh, I think are important steps to take. We'll talk a little bit about more about this uh, later as well. Also on the device side, uh, you know, it may sound basic, but you know, patching and updating your systems is a key part of good cybersecurity. A lot of these exploits, you know, target unpatched systems or, um, you know, things that are not up to date. So if you are in a good habit of updating your system uh, for the operating system, uh, third-party applications like Adobe, and uh, Java, all, you know, those applications are also avenues as well. Um, and then also updating uh, the device firmware, making sure that, you know, kind of all your devices are updating on a regular basis, uh, you know, ideally monthly, um, and make sure that you're, you know, rebooting your computer. I think, you know, Microsoft has, has kind of forced us a little bit to, to do this, you know, Windows update now is, is, is a lot more assertive in terms of installing updates and rebooting computers because they have to be. Um, and uh, I think in the same way, you know, I know I have a, you know, an iPhone and that's updated on a regular basis and it just kind of happens in the background um, automatically. I'd also say, you know, enable and use antivirus. Um, it is only 50% effective, you know, in some metrics, but, you know, 50% is better than zero. Uh, and I think in this approach of cybersecurity, we're, we're talking about building, you know, a multi-layered approach. Um, so kind of building layers of effective tools um, that can help, you know, protect us uh, in case something gets through and we click on something um, inadvertently. Uh, and then finally, on the identity side, you know, protect your identity. As I said, you know, we're not really behind the corporate firewall where everything is on the server in the office down the hall anymore. We haven't been there for quite a while at this point. And so it's really critical uh, for you know, for everyone to make sure that they have good passwords, that they're using a password manager, uh, that you've enabled multi-factor authentication um, to protect that identity. So that, you know, may be, you know, it may be complicated because you may log into 
five, 10, 50, 100 different systems. I, um, uh, so that, yeah, the, the, the most, I think, up-to-date research, yes, yeah, as people have, you know, on average, 100 passwords, right? So that's a, <laughs> that's a lot of things to remember. And so having a good way to manage and protect that, uh, I think, is really a key element of good cybersecurity. And then finally, know where your data lives. Again, we talked about this on the, on the device side, um, but also in the cloud as well. You know, what systems have access to your account information and i'll have some links on how you can check that uh, a little bit later on so again protecting the identity in terms of a good password manager um or i'm sorry how to create a good password you know there's lots of different philosophies around that uh we had a uh we have a, a blog article that uh, that we can chat out johan on 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 just how to create and pick uh, a good password something that's secure easy for you to remember and hard for computers to guess So as we move into kind of these cybersecurity, like what are good cybersecurity practices? I think this is a graphic that was really helpful for me to, to see and understand and hopefully explain here is, you know, what's the expert advice for cyber, good cybersecurity practices versus like, you know, Joe Schmo on the street. Uh, so we can see that uh, this comes out of, I think, Google Project Zero. Uh, that's their security focused um, entity. And so this is, you know, these are their recommendations in terms of data that they've uh, uh, collated from security experts. You know, again, so we see basic stuff, installing updates, using unique passwords. You know, every site that you log into should have a unique password in case one site, when it gets compromised, doesn't lead to other compromises. Um, using two-factor authentication. Again, um, you know, that's something that I talk about incessantly is the importance of multi-factor authentication or two-factor authentication that combines something that you know which is your password with something that you have, which is often just an app on your smartphone. And then using strong passwords, again, um, you know, something that's hard for, easy for you to remember, hard for the computer to guess. And then using a password manager to make it all easy. So again, uh, at the end of the day, you should only, you know, maybe have three or four passwords that you need to remember. A password for your computer, uh, a password to get into your, you know, password manager, uh, and then maybe, you know, one or two other things. But again, uh, you know, don't make it too hard for yourself. Don't build a pattern. <laughs> you know, use the password manager, let the tools work um, for you. You know, uh, don't, you know, don't worry about changing passwords frequently. Like that's tends to not be a good approach to security because you end up just picking new bad passwords. Um, you know, you don't need to only visit websites, you know, uh, you know, there's some, some, some things that are not necessarily uh, wrong in the in the kind of non-experts you know practices but again focusing on you know the updates new passwords making sure that multi-factor authentication is enabled strong passwords and a password manager is a really much more effective approach to raising the overall security uh, of you and your kind of the access to the data that you have so i think in a more you know helpful or easily distilled um, graphic uh, these are things that uh, you know, I would say are, are good places to start. So if you if you can't confidently say that you've checked off all of these things, uh, this is where I would start. You know, let's have make sure the backups are in place for your data. Make sure that your systems are updated on a regular basis. Make sure you've got multi-factor authentication in place with good passwords. Make sure you've got that antivirus turned on. Make sure you understand and know uh, which systems have access to your data through the cloud, and then. Uh, you know, from an organization perspective, make sure you've got uh, some cybersecurity uh, awareness training in place. So maybe this is a good time to get another poll here and uh, see where folks are at in terms of cybersecurity uh, training. So I'm going to uh, leave this up here, going to get a drink, and uh, we'll see where folks are at in terms of cybersecurity training. Oh, let's see. Thanks everybody for uh, chatting in here or responding. I'm gonna say the uh, these responses here are a little bit better than what I thought uh, they were gonna be based on the uh, initial survey, which led me to believe that you know 90% of folks weren't doing anything at all, which was kind of a scary thought. But um, 
so let's go ahead and uh, share the results here so we can see that, um, you know, mo you know, may, you know, almost half of the folks here are doing cybersecurity uh, training in, the, in an ad hoc manner when they get to it. Uh, looks like about a quarter of folks are doing it as part of their broader IT policy, so that's fantastic. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, and, you know, the other quarter that are, you know, cybersecurity training, what's that? Hey, you're going to be able to check that off. You know, you've done some <laughs> some cybersecurity training this year uh, and hopefully uh, been able to take away something uh, that uh, is interesting and, and actually has a meaningful impact on your uh, yourself or your organization. And as I mentioned, uh, the cybersecurity checklist, we talk a lot more about this in detail uh, in our cybersecurity uh, readiness uh, playbook. So go ahead and uh, check that out uh, after the webinar uh, if you haven't had a chance to do so yet. So putting this all into action. Um, so what does that mean? So I talked a little bit about, about backups and just kind of understanding your data is. So I think it's important to understand, understand that, right? I mean, it's no longer like, all my data is in the on the server down the hall. You know now we've got data uh, in all kinds of different cloud systems. We have you know data that's in our uh, desktop computer. We have data in cloud services. You know we've got pictures that are the most important thing. You know where is all that stuff? Um, how do we access it? What's how is it being protected? And then how is it being backed up? So ideally, uh, that data would be in somewhere other than the primary service provider. So again, you know, you know, so yes, even if you're in Office 365, I would recommend uh, making sure that you've got your data backed up in another location. There's lots of great tools uh, out there for that. Um, because, my, you know, Microsoft and Google, all the other big vendors, you know, your data is important, but they're primarily protecting themselves against, you know, a server failure or, or some kind of other crash. Like the protection is not so much, you know, if, your computer crashes or you get ransomware on your device or some, you know, something happens, uh, you know, you may be able to get it back um, or you may not. So uh, having it, having that data protected in a system uh, other than the primary vendor, I think is a critical piece uh, of IT security and also puts you in control. You know, you can manage the data, you have access to it. If something happens, you know, provider fails, uh, data is not available. You know, you've got another way to, to access that data. Again, we talked about it, you know, updating your devices, and that's all devices, you know, your phone, your computer, your tablet. Uh, ideally, that's something that you are, uh, you know, updating uh, monthly, uh, you know, for other devices, you know, updating system BIOS and uh, firmware and drivers uh, is also something I think that should be happening monthly. You know, we're able to automate that for, uh, our clients that have Dell computers, there's some some sophisticated stuff that we've developed to to do that. Uh, but it may be something you need to do manually. Uh, and then also make sure that you're just in a habit of rebooting weekly. You know, <laughs> these updates can't often get completely installed until a device is rebooted. So uh, it's a good habit if you can um, to reboot your computer at least on a weekly um, basis to make sure that everything is kind of clean and running well. You know, sometimes those reboots can take a long time. I know it's a hassle, you know, to close out of stuff, but uh, it really makes a difference. Uh, you know, reboot at the end of the day so your computer's ready for you the next day. Um, and I think, you know, Microsoft specifically, you know, has done a lot better job of, you know, kind of surfacing, you know, the stuff that you're working on. So again, if you had 10 different, you know, Word documents up, you know, they will often reopen and it's a lot easier to get back to them. Same thing with web browsers, um, but again, reboot uh, and reboot weekly. So for password managers um, or just password management in general, I think it's almost impossible uh, to do this on your own. Uh, I'm a big fan of password managers. Uh, and so uh, there's a couple of different ones out there. You know, I think LastPass, I mean, I, that's what I personally use. I, you know, I like it, I think it works well. I use it on my computer or my phone. Uh, and so I really, I don't remember passwords anymore. I don't generate my own passwords. I just, you know, automate everything, uh, which makes it easy to generate complex and unique passwords. And uh, I can access that uh, through the app. Uh, I know one password is also highly rated. Uh, if you have a favorite password manager, uh, you can go ahead and chat that in. I know, uh, you know, passwords are really personal. People really, you know, get into the <laughs> the tools and the devices that they use. So if there's something that you have, um, yeah, feel free to go ahead and chat that out. Um, and again, like I said, if if you do this right, you know, you don't actually need that many to remember that many unique passwords. You know, one for your computer, 
one for your password manager. You know, that's like minimalist password management. Um, yeah, you are putting a lot of faith into the system, um, which which I have. Um, but you know, it, it means that you can, you know, uh, generate sophisticated passwords that you don't have to remember, uh, and it would be easy to rotate or update if something does happen. Uh, and again, we have got some guides uh, how to create an excellent password uh, that's on our website. Um, have I been pwned is a great resource. Uh, I have a link and another slide or two that shows a little bit more about that. Again, you can uh, you know see if you if a password you use has already been compromised. Uh, and then finally, enable multi-factor authentication. Again, okay. that's you know I see thousands of of attacks against accounts, uh, and if you have multi-factor authentication, you're you know you have a much higher chance of being able to defend against that than you know than somebody just kind of walking in with the username and passwording and getting access to all of your information. And so specifically, you know, MFA is really effective. This is another slide um, from the Google Project Zero uh, talking about kind of how effective multi-factor th authentication is against various um, types of attacks. And so here, I think most organizations are gonna be protecting against the automated bot or kind of bulk phishing, right? So uh, MFA with on-device prompts. So again, that's like an authenticator app, Microsoft Authenticator, I think Google's got one, you know, Duo, there's a ton of them. Um, but they are very, very effective and much more effective than knowledge-based challenges. Again, you know, what's your secondary email address? You know, what's a phone number? Um, and they're more effective than, you know, SMS codes. Uh, down at the bottom, you'll see um, security keys. Um, those are becoming more popular. I use a security key um, for certain applications. I like it because it's really fast, um, but it is, it is limiting. Um, and, they're not, and security keys aren't supported by every application. So happy to talk more about YubiKey uh, or other, you know, FIDO authentication devices later. But, um, you know, the on-device prompt for Microsoft Authenticator or Google Authenticator uh, is super effective, easy to use, free, doesn't cost anything, uh, and it's very effective. Uh, this is Have I Been Pwned. Uh, you can check this out. Uh, type in a password. Um, Troy Hunt, uh, he's this Australian guy uh, that maintains the system. And so basically he, uh, every time there's a huge data breach, uh, somehow he gets a copy of uh, the passwords uh, that were included in that data breach, and he adds them to his database and then surfaces it up through this site. So again, uh, you can type in a password, any password. In this case, I typed great password. Uh, and that password has been seen 108 times before. So that basically means that bad guys know that this is a password that's in use. And so they'll try it against, you know, your username and password combination. So if you are using great password anywhere, don't anymore, <laughs> go pick a new password uh, and update those sites uh, to make sure that, uh, that your accounts that are using those passwords are secure. Um, again, antivirus, I think it is an important layer of protection. Uh, you know, it may miss 50% of attacks, better than zero. Um, and I think the good news is, is that there are new technologies and approaches that are available and, and some tools you may see called EDR or endpoint detection and response. Um, but those typically come uh, at a premium over antivirus. So, um, you know, I think if you're managing an organization, uh, I think it's important to have a, a third party AV tool so you can make sure that the systems that you're supporting and managing are all up to date. Um, you know, if you're a single user, uh, again, you can, you know, purchase a third party tool, uh, actually Microsoft Defender, which is now built into Windows 10, uh, does, a, does a pretty good job. Uh, and so that's, you know, even, even sufficient. So again, making sure that that is on, enabled and up to date um, is just one of those IT security um, fundamentals. And then the security awareness uh, checkup. So again, this is specifically, I'm talking about what systems have access to your data. Uh, so here's some links for how to aud um, audit access to applications. Um, so again, on Facebook, you can go through and see what apps <laughs> you've given the ability to view your profile and your friends list and all this other stuff. Um, Google, similarly, uh, you know, you can see which applications that you've maybe used Google to sign in, what access those applications have, uh, and then you can also revoke it again. Uh, and then LinkedIn, similarly, has a way to um, provide that. Uh, the example here uh, is, is in Google. So again, the Google Security Checkup uh, will show you like, hey, you should review the third-party access. Here's some devices. I, you know, like this was me. You know, no recent events in 28 days. I've got two-step verification. That's what they call 
uh, multi-factor authentication. So again, uh, it's not just, you know, uh, the applications you're using, but like, you know, all these third-party cloud applications, how do they inter interact? Uh, and making sure you've got a good list of um, how those systems, uh, what data you're sharing with those systems. And then finally on uh, cybersecurity awareness, training specifically. So this is data that comes from a vendor called Nobefore. It's the security awareness training tool that we use. Um, and so they provide training resources, you know, to everyone basically. Uh, and so they've got a lot of data to support, um, you know, their, their theses. And so they're able to say for SMB nonprofits with 101 to 249 staff, um, uh, you know, the initial baseline test, like, uh, the number of people that click on a malicious link is almost 40%. And we do this and we I've seen some organizations break that, right? So it's that means 40% of your users just clicking on stuff uh, that, that lands in their inbox. And so that's a pretty scary number. Uh, but then they also say that and their data shows that after 90 days after the initial training, that drops down to about under 15%. Uh, and then you know, one year into a training program that's under 5%. Um, and I will, and I, I mean, this, you know, mirrors what we see uh, in terms of the organizations. Whenever we're implementing a online security awareness training tool, uh, we, we get pretty good uh, reduction in the amount of people that are clicking on these malicious links that are contained uh, within emails. So uh, as we kind of wrap up here, just wanted to, you know, offer some encouragement that, you know, cybersecurity can be daunting, but it doesn't need to be overwhelming. So here's some specific things I'd like you to uh, take away from this. So, you know, if you're here as a as an individual, uh, you know, or maybe very small organization, you know, it's important, I think, that you inventory and back up your data. Make sure your computers are up to date and rebooted on a regular basis. Make sure that antivirus is installed. If you haven't yet already, get a password manager to store, manage, and generate passwords for all those sites that you're accessing. Um, and then uh, review system access, you know, what, what systems have access to your data and remove those unnecessary ones. And then finally, schedule time for security. I think, you know, this doesn't just happen on its own. It needs to be, um, I think, pursued intentionally. So make sure that you're blocking out some time in your, in your day, your week, or your month uh, to focus on that. Um, if you're here kind of representing or as part of an organization, um, I would say it's really important to start with policy. We really didn't talk about that much uh, in this webinar, um, but you know, starting with, you know, what are we supposed to do as an organization? Formalizing your, and then formalize your cybersecurity controls. And then I think it's really important to implement regular user engagement uh, that includes different elements. So again, we would typically do baseline phishing, have initial training, and then run quarterly phishing tests, quarterly focus trainings, and then provide regular reporting, and then incorporate feedback. So when we're talking specifically about cybersecurity awareness training, I think it's really important that the training must have executive buy-in. This is not something that IT can kind of do on its own. It needs to be coming from the top maybe the board, maybe executive leadership, but it needs, if in order for it to be effective, it needs to come um, from that senior executive level. Um, I would say it also needs to align with organizational culture. If, if you're doing security awareness training that's, you know, really strict and rigid and nothing else in your organization is strict and rigid, then you're probably not really going to be very effective. So, uh, you know, find a way to make the tools work with how your organization works. Um, I think it's really important that training should be frequent in its timing. So, um, you know, having a three hour security awareness training once a year, not that effective. You know, having a 20 to 30 minute training once a year, a five minute training once a quarter, that's great. You know, keeps it fresh, keeps people engaged, uh, and it's a lot more effective. I think it's also important, um, you know, to incorporate testing um, and feedback. You know, what's working, what's not, you know, is this training, does this speak to us as an organization or is this not really tailored um, to us. One of the reasons I like know before is they've got, you know, like thousands of uh, training resources available. And so you can find something that really works uh, for your organization and then build that culture of learning, right? I mean, this is something where uh, if you can get people engaged, staff can talk about it, they can be open, you know, you can be educated by the vendor that you're using. Uh, I think that's a, a much more effective approach than, you know, feeling like you're being talked down to, uh, you know, bullied into training, 
you know, punishing <laughs> uh, people that click on stuff, you know, making an example of them. Um, in my view, that's not a very uh, effective way to build a, a good culture around cybersecurity. And so, you know, working with a vendor uh, that, you know, is able to engage you to be a teacher uh, and educator around these topics is, I think you're gonna get much better results than, uh, you know, vendors that may, you know, have all the answers and kind of communicate it uh, in that way. So again, let's make sure that uh, as we wrap up here that you're um, setting a reminder for yourself. So we've got a lot of content. Uh, like I said, uh, you'll be able to uh, review this. This will be posted on our YouTube channel and you also get a copy of the slides. Uh, you know, so maybe a week from today, uh, set a reminder for yourself. Maybe one or two of those things you said, hey, like I really wanna get a password manager or, oh, I really wanna um, make sure I have a backup of all my uh, cloud data. Uh, set a, go ahead and set a reminder for yourself right now um, to do that. And then, you know, if you can take the step, you know, have an accountability partner. Is there somebody else in your organization that you can check in with? Uh, maybe a contact at your IT partner to say, hey, like, we really need to review X, Y, or Z. Let's, let's do that in a month. Go ahead and schedule some time for that uh, so that you can make this um, really actionable. So security doesn't really happen on its own. Uh, requires us to be engaged with it. So uh, schedule time to, to do that security now. So um, I've really uh, put out a lot of content. Um, I've been seeing the chat going the whole time, but I've not uh, had a chance to look at it. So we'll take some time now uh, to go over any uh, questions that may have come up, things that need clarification. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll see what we can do to, to answer any uh, additional comments that, that came up along the way. Great, thank you so much, Matt. That was a fantastic webinar, a training in and of itself in its own right. And we definitely encourage folks to um, check out the uh, the recording of this webinar on our YouTube channel and on our website. It should be available within the next day or two. Um, before we get to the Q&A, I did wanna mention our final webinar of 2020, which will be next month. And we will be partnering with Build Consulting, which is an information strategy consulting firm that focuses on nonprofit organizations. And next month, they're gonna be hosting an Ask the Experts panel webinar with uh, their three principals, Peter Miris, Kyle Haynes, and David Deal. And they're gonna be discussing uh, building a better nonprofit software selection process. So that will be next month, November 18th, from three to four o'clock in the afternoon. And uh, if you got a reminder about this webinar, you will get a reminder about that webinar too. And we encourage you to sign up and also um, share that with, uh, with anyone in your, in your network who you think might be interested in it. Um, so we only have just about two minutes left. Um, so really quickly, Matt, do you have any suggestions regarding HIPAA compliance as it relates to security? Uh, I mean, I think that could be a whole uh, webinar series in and of itself. I mean, I think HIPAA, more than anything, really needs to start with the compliance um, uh, policy side of things. And so working with legal to kind of frame that out, uh, I think is the is the first step to kind of figure out what you need to do uh, and what you, uh, and how you need to kind of set things up. So um, yeah, we can maybe talk about that uh, kind of follow up. I think HIPAA is such a complex beast in and of itself in and of itself, uh, I think the first step would, like I said, uh, you know, focus, you know, talk to the legal representation for the organization and kind of and go from there because it, it because there's such a severe impact uh, if you are not doing things uh, in a HIPAA compliant way that uh, you need to make sure all your bases are covered from a legal perspective first. Great, great, thank you, Matt. And last question, we got one minute left. Uh, this will probably take longer than a minute, but. Um, the current political climate, especially with the elections coming up, do you have any specific advice or resources for organizations who might be, you know, targeted or particularly vulnerable uh, with the elections in this political climate? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so uh, I didn't mention it actually in this presentation, um, but I think I covered it in uh, some, some other ones. So uh, if you're a Microsoft customer, uh, and actually if you're in Google as well. So both of those vendors have kind of m more sophisticated security controls that they are making available for free to organizations that may be, uh, you know, kind of higher risk 
uh, in this political climate. So for Microsoft, it's called uh, Account Guard, um, and Google, it's a name escapes me right now. But there, there's some additional security monitoring that they that they turn on. Um, we have a number of our clients that are that are using it. Um, I've worked with a Microsoft team um, on some security incident response stuff, and they're they're really fantastic uh, resources. Those are free, um, so Microsoft Account Guard uh, would be the thing to to check out first. Um, like I said, you know, kind of IT security fundamentals, you know, multi-factor authentication, uh, you know, again, for many vendors is going to be a free included solution. Uh, and so making sure that that's turned on, uh, is a, is a, is a, is a great place to start. I mean, every, every vendor, uh, every three letter agency is going to tell you that that needs to be in place. All right. Well, that'll um, have to, oh yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, so up on the screen now, uh, our, our list is to some, some other, uh, resources. So again, you know, we put out a lot of content, um, around, um, cybersecurity. So please check that out. Uh, also I talked about stop, think, connect, um, earlier. Uh, and so that's a, a free resource. So there's lots of great, you know, kind of getting started, um, tools there. Uh, also wanted to highlight that TechSoup has a COVID response bundle that has a lot of stuff, including a security 101 training and a security 201 training that I did um, about a year and a half ago. So the content uh, is still going to be pretty fresh and up to date. Uh, usually they charge for that, but uh, I think through their partnership with Microsoft, TechSoup is making that available for free. So again, if you need more uh, online training resources, uh, you could go check that out from TechSoup. Uh, know before has some free tools. Uh, we uh, use them as well for their paid offering, which I think is great. Uh, and Microsoft has added some free uh, cybersecurity training uh, that's available, especially if you're an Office 365 customer. It's okay. Um, but again, if you have no money and want to get started, um, that could be a good place to, to go first. All right. Thank you, Matt. Appreciate your time, your knowledge, and your expertise. And my thanks to everyone for joining us today for this webinar. Have a great month. Great. Thank you. Community IT does these free webinars and podcasts for our community, and we love sharing our knowledge and experience. If you have more questions or are having trouble with your IT at your nonprofit, please get in touch with us on our website, www.communityit.com, so we can start a conversation or schedule an assessment. Downloading any of our free resources there will get you signed up for our webinar reminders, and you can attend our next webinar in real time and ask our experts your own questions. If you love podcasts, please subscribe and leave us a rating to help others find this leadership resource for nonprofits.